So today I just want to talk about how you resolve things, how you resolve forces into components. And we're going to talk about just how it is in the most fundamental sense with a single force and you can uh, resolve it into a horizontal component as well as a vertical component and how you're also going to do it on slopes because these two are the biggest parts of really the basis of mechanics on the A level syllabus. So let's first start with the terminology. Uh, you might have heard of getting the resultant force of two forces. So for example, if you had two separate forces like this, the resultant force would be like this. And, and how we get that is we kind of bring this force over here. And we can draw this line. And then the resultant um, ultimate force is, is what's the final result of these two forces. And that's going to be the bigger force, right, in the middle. And you can think of resolving as kind of the reverse process of getting this resultant force. It's kind of like you have this resultant force and you split it back into the original things. And that's kind of the basis of what resolving is. It's splitting up a single force into two different components. And components is like, you know, the split it up things that you get out of it. Um, so yeah, that's basically what resolving, resolving is. It's resolving a single force into two perpendicular components, 90 degrees apart from each other. And the way that we can um, calculate this, I can show you, and it's really, really easy. So let's say you have a dog, and this is obviously a leash, and you're pulling the dog, you're presumably taller than your dog, and this is why the dog would not only feel a pull to the forward direction, but it will also you know, feel a little bit of a pull to the upward direction. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to quantify how much is actually the force in front and how much is actually the force when the dog is being pulled up as a result of this 15 newton force that's being pulled by your hand. And this is extremely simple. So you have 15 newtons and let's say it's, it's 30 degrees to ground. Um, that's what the triangle is going to look like. It's, it's very simple trigonometry. And what we do is we know that this is going to be 15 sine 30. And why is this? It's because, well, let's, let's denote this as V. V for vertical component. Um, sine 30 degrees is going to be uh, v divided by 15. And so if you put this over here, you're going to get 15 sine 30. Over here is the same thing. Horizontal component is going to be 15 cosine 30. And that's basically how you do resolving. So as a rule of thumb, the main thing that you should memorize is that if you have um, a resultant force or whatever force that you want to resolve, and let's say you are given the angle, it's theta, and this is magnitude f. The horizontally resolved force is going to have a magnitude of f cosine theta, and the vertically resolved force is going to have a magnitude of f sine theta. So I've written that here, horizontal component, cosine theta, vertical component, sine theta. And that's basically all there is to it. It's basic trigonometry because, you know, obviously from the sine theta, it's basically what we moved this thing. We just moved it to the side to make it look a little bit more easier to read. So with that information, we can actually solve some, some problems. It says a ball is pushed up from the ground with a force of 30 newtons at 30 degrees to the ground towards the right. What is the vertical and horizontal component of this force, presumably. So we can try to picture this first. Let's say there's a random ball and maybe there's a hand. It's my best drawing of a hand and the ball is on the ground. Um, and the hand is basically pushing this ball upwards, 30 newtons, and the angle that it makes is going to be 30 degrees. As we can see, it's being pushed up and also it's being pushed to the right. So that's what gave me this drawing right here. So the vertical component, as we've learned before, is super simple. V is, remember, F sine 
theta. And so that is 30 times sine 30 degrees. 30 newtons times sine 30 degrees. And sine 30 is uh, 1 out of 2, so that gives us 15 newtons. So the vertical component is 15 newton. Depending on the weight of the ball, uh, it's going to differ in its motion, but the resultant upwards force, because of the hand or whatever is pushing it, is going to be 15 newtons upwards. The horizontal component is going to be f cosine theta, and that's going to be 30 times cosine times 30 degrees. It's going to be 30 times square root 3 out of 2, which gives us 15 square root 3 newtons. So it's going to have a, uh, you know, a force of 15 square root 3 newtons. And that's basically the answer to this question. And we have a second part to the question. This part says, say the ball weighs 2 kgs, kilograms. After 20 seconds of applying this force, what is the speed of the ball? So before this, we've just been able to um, calculate that this ball has an upward force of 15 newtons, horizontal force of 15 square root 3 newtons. And now they're telling us that it weighs 2 kilograms. And actually, 2 kilograms, and that's the mass of it, right? So the weight of it would be 2 times 9.81 newtons because this is the gravitational constant which is 9.81 newtons per kg so that means the overall downward force into the earth is going to be 2 times 9.81 which is 19.62 newtons um so this means that obviously the resultant force in terms of the vertical plane would be that it's going downwards, but it's already on the floor, it's on the ground, as the question previously said, which means you can't really go further into the ground. It's just going to skid along the floor as you push it. Um, and obviously this would result in friction, but we're going to ignore that friction. Now, the only thing that we have to focus on is this 15 square root 3 newtons. So after 20 seconds of applying this, what is the speed of the ball? This is really easy. We know that F equals ma. It's Newton's first law of motion. So basically, we're going to get the acceleration. This F divided by M is going to be 15 square root 3 divided by 2. It's 2 kgs. And so this is going to be 7.5 square root 3 meters per second squared. Now with this, we can use one of the equations of uh, constant acceleration we could use V is U plus AT. Um, so initial motion, initial velocity is zero. Um, it's probably at rest. And acceleration is this. T is 20. So V is basically going to be zero plus 7.5 square root 3 times 20. Which is going to give us 150 square root 3 meters per second. So that is the answer to this question. And it's an example of how you resolve forces to determine the um, motion of a certain object. Now we're going to try resolving for the objects that are on slopes. And the thing is, when we do this and when we resolve, we always have to think of the reference frame. So, so before we had like a random force, we decided to divide it into this sort of like x, y axis sort of situation where you can see that my x is basically parallel to like the bottom of my screen, or top of my screen. My y is parallel to the, the sides of my screen. Now, it doesn't, it's not important in any way. We could have actually, because, you know, the whole point of resolving forces is just so that, you know, let's say we have another force. It's like that. We want to see how they interact. We want to see the, what the resultant force is. And that's why res we resolve. Because let's say this, we've resolved it into, you know, a little bit here and maybe a little bit here. This one, we can also resolve a little bit here and a little bit here. We find that we can actually calculate this. We can do plus minus, and this probably plus, add both of them together. We're going to get a resultant force and then we can, you know, get the resultant of the final two and see how they would interact. And so that's the whole point of resolving. 
my my point out of telling you all of this is that when you resolve it doesn't have to be at this certain like x and y axis it doesn't have to be like that we could actually even just make it like that that could be a reference frame and it wouldn't make a difference as long as we resolve each and every force in accordance with this reference frame the math would play out and we would still get the same thing so that's what i'm talking about which is that for for the situation of slopes that we see right here it's much easier to sh switch the reference frame now we're not going to use um this sort of thing this is not going to be used anymore but instead when it goes to the slope we're going to make the x-axis along the line of the slope so it's an, at an angle to the floor and then obviously the y-axis is just going to be 90 degrees to that so in vertically into and out of the slope right so yeah we have like a tilted kind of reference frames from this it's kind of like we tilted it to this side and why we use that is because ultimately what's what's really important about like the forces that it for an, an object on a slope is whether or not it will move down or up the slope would it um, stay stationary would it move up would it accelerate up and how fast would it move etc so we don't really need any other information about you know these types of forces because they don't really affect the resultant motion which is it's going to move along the slope and that's why we like to put the reference frame at an angle so it's kind of like tilted like this so i've already written here that this this mass has a mass of mg so let me clear this up the mass has a mass of m the weight is going to be mg you know g is obviously the gravitational um constant which is 9.81 newtons per kg and this is the weight and so we're trying to resolve um, one force going into it, into the slope, and one force along the line of the slope. And the general equation that you should memorize is that it's just mg cosine theta going into and mg sine theta going along it. And this is what you should memorize, really. And I think it's much easier to memorize um, because, you know, to derive, and I will show you how to derive it, it takes a lot of time. Um, and so it's nice to understand how it comes from. However, in the exam itself, you should probably use the, you know, memorized version of how things work. But let me tell you how you derive it. So basically, I've decided to take this slope, and let's say this slope has an angle of theta. I've decided to kind of transfer it to this triangle right here just to make life easier, and this is where the thing would be. So its weight goes down here, mg, mass times gravitational um, constant. So you can tell from this triangle that this line is going to be the um, horizontal component and this line is going to be the vertical component because now we have a tilted reference frame. This is theta and let's say this is 90 degrees. This is going to be 90 minus theta, which means this has to be theta because that's 90 degrees. We're going to say that this is also 90 degrees. So we've basically proven that these two triangles are similar triangles. So first of all, let's talk about this one. This is, um, I think this is the vertical component. Yeah. So the vertical component, which goes into and out of the slope, we can say that, let's use cosine over here. And this is mg, by the way, this whole thing, this is mg, this line. Cosine theta and we're going to take a look at this tiny triangle here cosine theta is going to be v vertical component divided by mg and so v is going to be mg cosine theta you can see that right here so we've proven that and then now we're going to do the horizontal one so for the horizontal uh, for the horizontal one yeah we can denote that as h and we're going to look at this bigger triangle right here so over here we want to look at sine because we were we're looking at this one as well as this one right so sine theta is looking at this it's going to be oh actually no for sine theta and for like the horizontal component we actually have to look at this small triangle still so we found out that this was v and this is going to be h so this big triangle does not play a role 
it just plays a role in telling us the theta and how it translates over here. This is what the horizontal um, component is going to be. Now look at this, and we're trying to relate this h with this mg. So obviously, because theta is here, we're going to have to use sine. So sine theta is going to be h over mg, which gives us h is mg sine theta. So that is how you get to do the two different um, equations of mg cosine theta when it goes into and out of the slope and mg sine theta when it goes along the slope. So that's how you derive these equations. So now let's try a problem. It says, assume there is no friction. What is the resultant acceleration down the slope? So we're just talking about forces along the slope, which means we don't really have to care about this vertical component. We just have to talk about the horizontal component. So for the horizontal component, we already know that it is mg cosine theta. Oh, hold on, sorry. It's mg sine theta. We have to get these right. So it's mg cosine theta downwards, mg sine theta to the side. So yeah, this is the equation. And therefore, it's super easy. We have this, this is m. So mg is going to be 3 times 9.81. So the horizontal component, which is mg sine theta, is going to be 3 times 9.81 times sine 30 degrees. And we can calculate that, which is going to be 3 times 9.81 times 1 out of 2. So this is this, which will give us. 14.715. So that is the resultant force down the slope. And so acceleration, we know F equals MA because of Newton's first law. A is F divided by M. So it's basically just 14.715 divided by 3, which will give us 4.905. So the resultant acceleration is 4.905 meters per second squared. Now I want to take a look at a final question and this one is a, a bit more complicated. Um, we are looking at the slope right here, the angle is 25 degrees, but not only that, we have this, this string that's attached to this mass and it's pulling at 10 degrees upwards to the line of the slope. So it's very, very complicated. Um, and the question is, how far will this block travel in 8 seconds? Give the displacement from the original position if the displacement up the slope was positive and that down the slope was negative. So this means, you know, from this, let's say this is O. We're trying to see the displacement up or down. This place is going to be up, positive. This place is going to be down, which is negative. So the most important thing is to get the resultant force. With the resultant force, we can do all sorts of things um, such as getting the acceleration, and then we can get the displacement. But first of all, let's take a look at some of these um, forces. So 5 kgs means the weight is going to be 5 times 9.81. And you can see that for this one, we will also have to resolve it, right? But right now, we're not talking about whether or not it will float up or we would float down because the vertical component comes into handy when you're talking about friction um, and the friction coefficient of friction. So maybe you will touch on that in a later topic. But right now, we only need to talk about the horizontal components, the ones along the slope. So right now, we're just going to t think about the horizontal components which is here, and remember that the horizontal component is mg sine theta. Theta is over here, so 5 times 9.81 times sine 25 degrees, as seen here, and so we get h right here. And if I put it on a calculator, I get 20.73 um, newtons, so that's downwards. We also have to see how much this would end up. So I already said that we're going to ignore the vertical component, so we're just going to try and get this one. Now, for this, we just have to think about it in um, kind of like 
tilted reference frame sort of way. So we eventually get the fact that this is going to be horizontal component, which is going to be 4s cosine theta. So I really want to make the difference straight between these two types. And the fact is, this one, we're getting the components from a force that's going here, in this direction. For this, we're resolving from a force that is between them, going upwards. And that's why over here, we're literally talking about mg sine theta. Here, we're talking about f cosine theta, as we saw in the earlier part of this video. So this horizontal thing, remember this is going to be negative, by the way, because it's going to the negative direction. This is going to be positive. So h is f cosine theta and yeah basically f is going to be 8 newtons cosine 10 and that gives us 7.88 newtons so the resultant force of this would obviously be towards the negative side so negative to 20.73 newtons plus 7.88 newtons and that would give us minus 12.5 newtons. So it's going to this side. Um, so we can very easily get the final displacement from this as well. For example, we can use um, the equation S, which is displacement, is ut plus 1 out of 2 at squared. Um, that's going to be the equation that we're going to use. Now, acceleration is force divided by mass, so the acceleration is just going to be 12 minus 12.5 divided by 5, which gives us minus 2.5. And u, the initial velocity, is 0. So s is going to be 0 plus 1 out of 2, and this is a negative acceleration, so 2.5 and times 8 squared. And that's going to be the answer. So if we can um, multiply all of these together, we get our final answer of negative 79.9, which I'm going to round up to negative 80 meters, which means it's going to be 80 meters down the slope, which is a, a huge distance. But yeah, this was a, an example of a more complicated uh, question that you might face and this is the most fundamental thing to know about mechanics at such a primary level of math um, that's really going to help you so yeah thank you for watching